Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I have been doing a series of webinars now for, in March, it will be three years, started during the pandemic, and now we have over 300 webinars. I think this is number 302. Um, yay. Yay. I had no idea this was going to happen, and um, but it's been super, super fun, and I've had lots and lots of guests, um, but this is one guest that a lot of people said, you two really need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm so delighted to ha uh, have Celeste Lazarus with me this evening. So welcome, Celeste. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank today. you. It's so good to be here. I'm so excited. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, your name has kind of floated around. I've, I heard it, um, you know, and then you know how things go. You kind of go off on your <laughs> way and then it comes back. And then I was on a Zoom call and it came up three times in the week, like maybe in three days. <laughs> And I was like, okay. And I was, while I'm on the Zoom call, I went to your website and I put it out of an email and boom, you responded like, right. Away. Yeah. I was so surprised because I, you know, I, I go looking for guests and a lot of times I'll do that and I get, you know, that's what I get back. Okay. So, so that was a blast. I was really excited. And then of course we got on the phone and we chatted for a couple of hours and, um, and you were kind enough to agree to do a webinar. So I'm really, really <laughs> So just, you know, like, uh, like, tell us your, your background. Tell us what's up. How oh, my background, um, horse crazy kid I was always a horse crazy kid. Um, first, like real, I guess, like nitty gritty experience in doing training was I was in another foster care system. And so at a foster home that I was at, they basically put, um, troubled horses in with the troubled teams and we would work together. And so that, that was a skill that they really good. So they, how did we start out with that? My foster dad was a bridal horseman, um, which was fantastic. And I didn't understand, as most children don't, the privilege that I got with um, getting to ride really well-trained, balanced horses that were very light and had a good relationship with connection and feel and all of that. And I was held to a very high standard on how I rode them. <laughs> and then my foster mom was a dressage rider and it was always kind of fun because they had conflicting, you know, we had like the dressage <laughs> and the cowboy. Um but really they said the same thing just in two very different ways. And so it was kind of fun. So she was more performance oriented. He was like, my horses like have to go and work cattle. Not anymore because we were in Hawaii. We didn't really have cattle anymore, but he came from- Okay, Oklahoma. so no, what is it? Let's unpack this a little. So this was, you were in Hawaii. Yeah, I was bred, bred born and raised in Hawaii for 17 years. <laughs> okay. Um, yep. And um, how old were you? And now you? I'm in Washington. When you, that's okay. It's really close to Hawaii relative to where I am. Um, how mm -hmm. close, how old were you when you- got on the first horse uh two. Oh, okay maybe, so you... maybe not even quite two but that was yeah so my grand my well so we really want to scale it back my grandparents had um mules my grandpa had cart mules that he used for their garden for general traveling for all of these things and um, they were not trained to be ridden but they they could pull a cart so they would like tolerate things on their back and so there's many many pictures of me as a little baby and a little girl on my grandpa's cart mules and then when we would come over, so they lived here in Washington. So I'd come over here and I'd visit in the summertime and I was like, I have to ride them. And, you know, in context now, so now I'm a parent and now I can look back at like what the things that I did at those ages, I was like my poor mom. But when I was, <laughs> sorry, yeah, how old was, yes. I think I was, I think I was five. This is one of my favorite stories. This was not one of her very favorite stories when I was older, because I'm still alive. But when I was five, I got this like wild hair. Cause, it, cause when we were kids, like it wasn't like it is now, like we, we just went outside all day and nobody knew we're right. checked in on us. We were fine. Right. right. Like that was great. So when I was like five or six years old, I would just be outside in the summertime. We had a garden. My grandparents had property. They had the mules, they had dogs. And so I would just stay outside for the day and it was lovely. And I had figured out that if I took some apples with me I could get the older of the two mules that it was a little bit more tame I could lead him out to the back corner of the pasture so this is before I've had lessons by the way like yeah, should yeah. not be should not be on a horse so I would lead I would bri I'd bribe them I would lead them I'd bribe said mules out to the bottom of the pasture and I'd put the apples down on the ground and then you know his head would be down eating so he'd be busy doing something and then I would shimmy up the fence and I'd spider monkey onto his back and I'd get on his back and I would just hang on and then when he was done eating his apples, he would get up and he would promptly bolt back to the barn because that's what we did. And so I was so excited because I got to go for a gallop every time this happened. So by the time I had my first riding lesson, I already had a pretty, you know, not good equitation, but I had a good seat because I could stay on a, a galloping mule, mule. A, a galloping mule riding up the pasture. <laughs> so they were, you know, 
that was fun. So that was how I developed my seat. Um, and there was lots of bucking and cropping and I, you know, oh my God, I must have ate shit so many times. <laughs> one time I, one time I landed in a, a grounds bees nest. That was really brutal. Um, but yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I was always very determined to ride and I, I didn't care that I fell off and I didn't care. I was like, nope, I, I will ride. And so that was a, that was a thing. And yeah, well, that's fun. So, so, so I don't think it was by accident that you wound up with foster parents that had horses then. No, that was not an accident. That was actually, I got very lucky. Um, in kind of the way that the system worked in Hawaii is I would get, I got put into at eight years old was when I CPS kind of took over and I went back and forth to different foster homes, but they always tried really hard to put me back with my mom when she was doing well. And so she tried kind of to, I guess, make life a little bit easier. She tried to hook me up with writing lessons. And so she found a trainer in Hawaii that was lovely. I had a, I had a couple different ones, but this last one that I ended up living with as my foster parent, um, I had taken lessons from them in between several different homes and several different situations. And at one point they reached out, I think I was 14, 13, 13 or 14 at the time, I think 13. And they just told my mom, they're like, Hey, like, we'll just take on guardianship if you want. And then that way, you know, it can still be the same situation. Like when you're clean and things are going well, you know, you can have her back essentially, but then that way she doesn't have to go through these other situations. She can just stay here where she knows and has horses and the, you know, community of people. So I was super fortunate in that because the, the ones I was in before was not a good time. Well, and that your mom recognized your love for horses and, and yeah supported that that's really awesome so when so, I got it from her she she had a fierce love so I mean it was 100% in my blood <laughs> okay awesome so so you wind up in this situation where you've got the the rain cow horse guy and the draft dodger <laughs> yeah was it rain cow yeah. no it was spade bit. it wasn't yeah it's a like vaquero style right so it's a little bit different than rain cow horse and the yeah. how they go about things but similar mm -hmm. And so, um, so which did you like, just go back and forth between them and try to figure out what the storyline was or? Well, so my foster mom was a nurse and she would do, she worked on a different Island. And so when she was, <laughs> she's going to watch this one day and be like, what the fuck? <laughs> so she would, <laughs> she would travel to a different Island for three, three days out of the week. And when she was gone, he would take me out and he'd be like, I'm going to teach you how to really ride now. And then, you know. And so I don't know if it was part of the like, like super secret, like I'm going to learn how to do this thing that like I shouldn't be doing because it's, you know, Western instead of English. Cause you know, there's very, there's that divisiveness, right? Like the English people can't talk to the Western people, which I don't um, get. Okay. Like, I, don't I don't get, get because either. Gravity doesn't care. Okay. Gravity does not care. And neither do the horses if we're being completely right. honest. So I, you know, I, I, because I was raised with both. So, so very much that to me, I was like, these really are. And nobody ever noticed when I was writing one versus the other, it was just, you know, I'm either sitting in a different saddle or I'm using my reins in a different way, but that's it. But for the most part, I, you know, you don't use your reins a whole lot. It's more seat and leg cues anyway. So right. I, I don't know. I didn't really notice anything different. Um, and then we had a, she had a lady named Una Clancy that would fly over from Irish, from Ireland, from Irish. She's very Irish. So she'd fly over from Ireland and she would do clinics and she was vicious she's very mean I love her so much um but there was not a single clinic that she did um that I I did not cry after and felt you know just because that's just what you do right like you're very mean to these people and this went on for like years and I remember the end of one of the last clinics she came over to do we we're all having lunch after and I was like why don't you like me <laughs> like I just had to ask her like because she was so hard on me she's so hard on me I was like why don't you like me and she was sitting back. She'd had a couple of drinks at this point. And she was like, well, you're the best writer out there. I'm not going to be easy on you. And I was like, she was like, well, yeah, I mean, like, and it's just, that was her, that was her thing. She was very much like holding me to a high standard, but she would come over and she did clinics on jumping. So I got introduced to jumping and I was like, well, this is like the most fun thing in the entire universe. I can go fast and over things. Like I can ride a horse in midair. This is brilliant. So, and going back to the mules, I remember, because again, I was a child and they were not trained in any way, like to go off of seat, leg, anything. It was, you know, it's, it's a cart, it's a cart mule, but there was another alley that I could bribe the mules into. And I would, this is before my jumping lessons and I would stack logs. I'd stack these old logs up to try to get the mules to, cause they would bolt back cause they were barn sour. And so anywhere that I could bribe them, I knew that we would run back. And so 
if I set up a jump, then they would, they'd go over the jump. So I thought, you know, jumping was great. <laughs> All right. So, um, so then did you like segue from dressage and Vaquero to jumping or what? Yeah. I mean, I, so I never competed in dressage ever. Well, that, I mean, that's not true. I guess I did a schooling show as a child up there, um, down there. But yeah. Then I got into jumping. I thought that jumping was great. So I competed there for a while. And basically one of the main things that I've, I just love everything that has to do with horses. So like when I moved over to Washington, um, I dated a cowboy for a little while that did like cattle, like he, he was an actual cowboy. So like he did, you know, cattle sorting and all of those things. And I was like, this is really cool. So, and I did that. And then I got into barrel racing and then I got into a little bit of mounted shooting. And it's like literally anything that I can find that is involved with horses, I love. And I have never personally, while well, I'll agree that, um, you know, I mean, the horses should like, depending on the discipline and how high up through the levels you want to do, like they do need to condition a certain way to be appropriate for that. But as a jockey, as a rider for that, it like, I couldn't, my, my one main guy that I had when I moved over here, I bought him at, who's just shy of two. And he ended up doing everything with me. And we would go to a jumping show one weekend and we go to a barrel race the next weekend, or then I'd ride him in a parade, or then I would take him out and I'd pony a baby horse off of him down through the mountains. And it's, I've, I feel like horses should be, should be able to do everything. And if they're trained right and they're developed correctly, it's not really a big ask for them. Um, and I, I find it to be incredibly good for their mental well being. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree not more, having, you know, the, the varieties, uh, cross training, it, they don't have to be excellent at every one of those disciplines, but just mm -hmm. the experience of it just um, develops, you know, more choices and more possibilities and kind of around, it's just like anybody, like an athlete, it rounds out your yep. abilities because you have more experience. Yeah, yes. truly. Um, I'm awesome. a big proponent for doing things down the trail. So even now to this day, when I get in rehab horses, it doesn't matter if they're Grand Prix dressage horse or if they're jumper, it doesn't matter what they do. One of my secret sauces to my training program is that I do pretty much all of it out on the trail. <clears throat> so I have a really beautiful hunt club field that we go that we haul to. So it's very well groomed. The footing's nice. Oh. Um, They're in Tacoma. Yeah. Yeah. The Woodbrook, Woodbrook hunt club field. Yeah. Do you know, uh, um, is it Firestar? Starfire? Star, uh, Starfire. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Tammy. yeah they're awesome. That's awesome. They're Tammy. so great. Well, Tammy and I, we, we always reminisce about the, you know, this is going to date me because, um, but the, the old days and what yeah 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 it was like uh yeah no she's on she's awesome. a hoot she yeah, is a hoot they're, they're and that's why I was like we, we could hysterical. talk about a lot of old days hunters back you know because I'm from yeah. Fairfield County Connecticut you know big hunter country yeah uh, you know yeah yeah so, I've done one I've gone on one hunt with them and they are a crazy group of humans like that's next level on some of the things I'm like oh you guys are like kind of bad that you like that these horses like they get on these horses that are completely the poor horses are just like completely out of their mind because that's that's just what they do and they're like no it's just a good time just have a couple drinks and we'll go out there I'm like okay <laughs> don't feel like the horses love it. River they love fox hunting my oh, horse that is his absolute it. favorite thing to do you know he love falls it. down he's totally <laughs> totally uh hooked I'm just gonna make sure anybody else is trying to get in okay so you, yep, there are more people trying to get into the webinar. Um, so you, oh, uh, moved, yeah. So I, I I use back there. Okay. So all right. So now here you are in Tacoma, and you brought your horse over, and you're doing all kinds of different disciplines with them. And then what? I mean, like, how did we? How did you get from there to here? So I actually didn't bring my horse over. I sold my horse okay. to move over. Um, let's see. So you got the two year old over here then? No. Yeah. Oh yeah. I bought him over here. Yeah. Yep. So I sold my horse in Hawaii, sold my tack in Hawaii, um, and went back and forth till about 22 is when I like settled in Washington, like actually settled. I came over here in the winter time, lived with my grandparents through the winter and I kind of went back and forth while I transitioned. It's a big change to move from Hawaii to Washington, especially when you're raised there. Um, it's a very big culture shock, I think would be the safe way to say it from moving from being raised in that environment over here. And so I did that. Um, still, still writing lightly, 
doing, like I went to lessons, kind of worked at a couple of little barns, just to, like be around horses, but I wasn't ready to buy my own horse again. And then I found the cousin to my horse and I was like, yes, that was him. So I bought him. I was very excited. It's a, he, they're both this, well, mine now today is a, so he's a Cochise son and mine in Hawaii was a Kimosabi grandson, different, but they're, you know, similar related, similar thoroughbred bloodlines as well. They both had native dancer on them. And so I was like as close as I can get to Paisano. So I'm going to do it. And it was, it was very similar in, um, in movement and personality, which is great. So we bonded well. And then I didn't, you know, I had a grown up job. I got married. I had kids. I stayed riding and I would take him to shows every once in a while, but it wasn't like a professional thing. And then I had a blip where I went down to California and I worked for somebody, um, as their like ranch manager, I wanted to play with babies. And so I went down and she had a beautiful breeding facility that was down there. And she had also previously worked with a lot of, there's a, a non-disclosure agreement. So I unfortunately can't list her name, but she, she worked with a lot of really big names and she was a big name jumper. Um, and so it was really a cool experience for me because I got to, I wasn't technically a working student. I was a ranch manager there, but I got to take lessons from her and I got to ride some of her horses. And it was just an incredible privilege to be able to ride again, these, I mean, these horses were big time Grand Prix jumpers and to get to hear her teach through these things was a completely different experience than anything I'd heard, just a different lens. Um, and then you have the, the ranch management side where we just bred babies and we had babies every year. And then we had the year before the yearlings and the year before that, the two-year-olds and they would keep the babies in with the horses. And so you got to have like a lot of the herd environment through there and in between from before that. And then one of the other draws that took me to this facility particularly is that she had also done a lot of work with Mustangs and so I had also re like been super interested in that so I'd been working with the BLM I'd been not with them particularly but going out and saying like hey I would like to um, donate my time can I come out and spend some time can I come out and observe so I'd already been doing that and then this woman was a legit like equine behaviorist they would send her out to look into things and so getting to spend time with her both from her performance lens and then the behavior was just so cool and watching um as a mom, I'll, I'll speak to this really quick. One of the things that I remember the most about the herds that I loved is if anybody's never gotten to experience this, it's brilliant. So her horses <clears throat> were kept, they're a, like a preservation breed. And so they were kept very similar to Mustangs. And what was interesting to watch is that all of the mares were kept together. There was like a mare motel, big, huge, huge pasture. So all of the mares were kept together and they'd have their babies. And then there'd be like the yearlings and the two-year-olds were in there too. And so they would keep them all together. The mares that had the babies that year, so they're new babies, the other mares would come in for several, several hours out of a day and they would take the new babies away so that the new moms had a break. And so the new moms would be totally chill, like get to have a break from baby. And then, you know, then the babies would go back and they'd nurse or whatever. And then the other moms would take them away from them again. The other moms were the ones that did all of the disciplining that like the actual moms didn't have to do it. It was so cool. And I was like, here's this incredible dynamic of, watching you know like they knew when you know somebody was getting fresher or when somebody needed more discipline and and they just all it was such a cool thing to watch the family unit I'm like god humans need to do this yeah. <laughs> this is you brilliant. know elephants are a lot there's a, it's a matriarchal society um with it's incredible and they're fascinating fascinating um um because I take people on horseback safari to Kenya and we always oh, go to the wow. elephant orphanage and, you know, meet the elephant orphans and follow, mm. we follow them and how they go back into the, into the wild herds. And it's just the, the, um, the dynamics that we don't get to see because we're not in an environment where they're in, you know, we're just observing what their natural environment is. Right. Yeah. So, um, we, we don't get often to see that that's really so your experience ranges everything from the caro to um, it's a lot <laughs> no it's okay but that's you know yeah. like what why that interests me is 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 just this is when you have that kind of broad experience of horses in multiple disciplines multiple multiple different breeds varieties of settings different levels of experience you get a really different sense I always think of people you know like um, yeah. people judge themselves. Okay. So, so this is their experience and they think of themselves as, uh, you know, like an intermediate because this is mm -hmm. the lens, but if you go like this, that's a very right. different thing. Right. And so mm -hmm. the that depth of, um, 
experience. And I didn't realize how far back. I didn't realize that you were riding mules. At- <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and galloping when nobody knew about it. Um, so I just find that you know, like I have some guests that using that, bailing bailing twine for reins. By the way, because we didn't have real. <laughs> you know, it's I'm I'm always curious in my guests and 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 the thread through right. So anyway, right. so here we are now. You've done the mustangs. You've done all these different other things. What mm-hmm. what? Where did your passion go next? So then from there, um, I ended up that was when I actually got married. So then that was when I married my, um, my ex-husband, <laughs> my now ex-husband, the father of my boys. And we moved back up to Washington. I had had my horse down there. We'd collected a couple more horses at the time. And so I quit there moved back up here and then tried to do the wife thing. And I, you know, I went back to school and I was gonna, you know, not do horses professionally for, I don't know. I, I don't know why I, I do that. I've done that a few times and I'm like, no, 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 it's fine. I'll go get a grown up job. <laughs> Um, and so I did that for a little while, but again, you know, it's like, you can't not. So I would go out and ride my horses on the weekend and then somebody would come out and they'd be like, Hey, do you ever give lessons? And I'm like, not anymore. No, I don't. I'm not going to do this. And then I, you know, and then I would say yes. And then that person would get a lesson and then somebody else would ask. And then pretty soon they asked if they could go to a show and then it was, you know, here we are. And so that would happen. And so I, then I ended up getting and say getting I ended up accidentally growing a a training business and so I quit my grown-up job and I just did that for a while and it was lovely and it was great and it was just it was a performance training business because we had multiple different disciplines and they were a bunch of people that just wanted to show they wanted to go to either rated shows or schooling shows they didn't care they just they wanted to compete and I love competing I think competing is fun and again with a broad range of different you know styles to kind of pull from it was a really easy thing to do so I did that for several years and it was great and my clients won and I won and my horses were great and every metric that I could list off for being successful was successful <clears throat> and then um you know I got introduced to equine body work and it ruled ruined my entire life and I found out my entire life in existence was a lie and here we are <laughs> so so how how or when, or <laughs> how did that happen? I guess it's a... um, this lovely woman came out to the facility that I was training out of and I'd seen her before. And like, she would, she, she would come out and she'd work on horses. She was a massage therapist. She'd come out and she'd work on horses. And I didn't really ever pay any mind to it because I didn't get massages. And so why would my horse get massages? Like, that's silly. Like they don't need a spa day. You know, that's a, what a weird thing to do for a horse. And <laughs> like truly, truly was, was my, and it's, you know, I own it totally now. Um, but she came out and I, again, from my, my list of experiences, particularly with Mustangs and different ones. And, and, and even going back to my foster care, like I would get pretty raunchy horses. And so I've learned, I had learned how to be very skilled, um, with horses that presented as dangerous or really chronic behavior. I've got a total Velcro butt. So if the horse came in that had, you know, chronic bucking issues or whatever, like I could ride him through it. It was fine. Ride him through it. All these things, right? Like how we used to do things. And so because I had a name for being somebody that specialized in gnarly cases, her being the body worker was like, I bet you have some pretty chronic bodies in your system. And so she came over and she was like, Hey, I, you know, do you have any horses you'd like me to work on? And I was like, Oh no, that's, that's fine. We don't do body work. It's, you know, try to be polite about it. And I'm sure she could see through the fact that I was just being, you know, egotistical in my twenties and not knowing anything about what I'm talking about. And she said, I'll tell you what, pull out your toughest case that you have right now. Let me work on them. I won't charge you anything. You can just the free demo, see if you like it. And I'm like, okay. And I watch her work on the horse and, you know, he looks and shoes and yawns and like has a nice time. And that's all very good. Well, and fine. Thanked her. And she went on her way. And I, pulled the horse out the next day and probably the majority of the behavior issues were gone. And I was like, I mean, we had a really good training session before the horse got worked on. So, I mean, I really think that was probably the ride that got through to it. So there's all these things I'm telling myself, right? Yeah, no, I I hear this all the time. Okay. Fully coincidental, fully coincidental, you know? And so, um, but she came back out the next day is like a couple of weeks later, she comes back out and I'm like, okay, I won't be an ass this time. This time I will pay her and I will have her work on several horses. Cause I am actually curious, you know, I'm not, I was closed minded enough that I wouldn't have ne- necessarily sought it out, but I'm like, okay, well, I'll at least dig a little bit. So then I had her work on several other horses and it just kept being the same 
the same situation. Like so many things would go away. And, you know, then you sit there and you have to, you have to be forced to sit with this like nearly ego eradicating moment of, okay, so maybe I'm a skilled trainer and a writer. I'm a very manipulative writer, right? I can get on and I can get the horses to, to seem fine and to go through things. And, um, but maybe by me doing that, I'm very clearly riding them through something that's uncomfortable because she was able to get them out of pain and then the behavior goes away. So holy shit, maybe behavior equals pain like that. So, and it was not, it was not ever a conversation that I had ever had, which was crazy. Um, you know, it it, just, it, it's such a good point that I, I think that's, that typifies a lot of trainers. They're, they're good enough trainers that they mm -hmm. can get the horse through the problem um, fully and yet you know we're finally uh, finally i don't know that it's finally but um we're starting to realize more and more that th that there are other ways to do it but one of the mm -hmm. big blocks is that somebody's a very good trainer and so why do i need this why do i need right. a way to approach it and mm -hmm. um you know like, that's the thing about horses is that there's we have such history like thousands of years of history um that new ideas are difficult because this this is the way it's been done this is the way we do it right. this is just a problem horse he'll be okay we'll just work work him through um and so it's sometimes change is harder because of the skill level yeah oh fully and you know and again i mean and we just talked about like i have a very broad range in my background of people that i worked with and for and, and on and it was just never a conversation. And so it was a really, really tricky one for me to sit there and actually be like, I mean, it's pain. Like my horse isn't really legged. There's no heat and swelling. I was a vet tech before. Like, I'm like, I know how to go through and check and see if a horse is like measurably in discomfort. And, and that's the other thing that gets really difficult as a body worker. We see things and we can palpate things that are so much like fully a hundred percent, I can tell you that this horse is in discomfort or the horse is having, you know, nerve compression pain or, or you know, an array of things. And they're completely sound. They go out and do their job. They may have just come in and won a huge competition. They're fine for all, all intents and purposes. The horses are fine for all of the other metrics that we are taught. And so for me to remedy that in my brain was really difficult. And so after I kind of had that blast, I couldn't ignore it anymore. Right. Cause it, you can't not. And I have always had a really deep connection with my horses. And, you know, now, now that has changed over time as I have learned the things that I've learned, but I have, I mean, horses saved my life. They saved my life as a kid. They saved my life as a teenager. Like I truly, oh, I, I, I would not be here if it was not for them. So I do deeply have a, you know, a very, you know, a lot of gratitude and connection to them. And so when my horses were saying, Hey, I feel better or watching them go through that, I couldn't turn an eye to it. So then my contribution to my business and to society was I was going to, I hired her and I just said every time, and I would tell, and I told all my clients, like anytime a horse comes into me, I'm not riding them. They're not going through any of my program unless they get worked on first. Like they have to be worked on first. Um, and then that way I can get an actual baseline for what's going on. And if she says the horse needs to be worked on once a week while it's in the program or not ridden while like, that's fine. Like whatever, whatever the body worker says is what we're going to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I did that and it was great. And then, you know, what was funny is then my training business got even bigger because then the horses were getting better faster. And so I was like, I have this secret weapon and it's so fun. Um, and then her business really blew up. And so she wasn't able to come out quite as often as she would. And so, and I'd been working with her for a while that she's like, I'll just teach you how to do this for your own horses. And in Washington state, you have to be very heavily licensed to work on horses um, if you're getting paid for it. I was just doing it as part of my things. So when I started doing it, I was not licensed. I am now because now this is what I do for a living. And isn't so I it did that. funny how it just kind of takes over? <laughs> oh my God. It took over my whole like existence. Like I even went back to school to work on humans. I mean, I never thought I'd work on humans. humans yeah. are gross. Like why would I do that? I touch feet now. Um, and it does, it truly took over my whole life, but that was the other thing that was really hard is so then when I started working on my own horses, that was when my like kind of mental breakdown happened. Um, and I, I shut that whole training business down because I was like, and I, I, did, I did try to tweak it a little bit, but it was hard because my clients were already 
they were on board with body work as long as they could still do what they wanted to do and like how they did things. And we had shows like we had a show, you know, it's a typical thing. Like you have a, you have a show season and you have sh- like scheduled things that you're trying to get to and like, here are my goals and I'm going to do bam, bam, bam. And that kind of goes out the window when you have this different lens with horses, you can't have the timeline like that, like we used to and how we were trained. And so when I started working on them, I got so good at palpating and really feeling like all, you know, all the things that happen when you're a body worker that then I would feel them before and after their rides and before and after lessons. And I could find where these tension patterns were coming back up again because they were ridden. And that really messed me up because again, I'm a good writer. I've got a good C. I've got very quiet hands. My I'm very, I've always been, again, being raised by a vaquero. If you pick up on those reins, like big no, no, I was grounded for weeks. So very, very, very good with my hands. But even with all of that, my horses, and they weren't in pain, but it was like, but there was a tension pattern that wasn't there when we started. And I truly believe that a horse, and I, you know, and I think everybody can agree, like our horses should be better when we get off. And that was not the case. And so I asked vets and I asked that body worker, I asked several body workers and I was like, what, what can we do? And I kept coming. The only answer that I was getting was that that's just, you know, that's just what happens with them. Like, you know, they're, they're working, it's a job, you know? So I didn't ever have an answer for why it was happening and I couldn't remedy it. And I can't exactly tell you why it broke my brain so bad, but it just really, truly did. Um, and so I quit training and I quit writing and I quit giving lessons and I went back and got a grown up job again and was like, I need to just figure this out. So I just, I just worked on horses for about two or three years and I didn't say anything. I didn't even tell people when I was a body worker that I had ever been a trainer before. Like I was just a body worker and probably, you know, far as they know, like, I remember one time somebody was like, Oh, would you ever be interested in going on a trail ride with us? Have you, have you ever sat on a horse before? We can tack them up for you. They're very broke. And I was like, Okay, it's fine. (laughs) Um, But that was how much my marketing was different because I was like, I'm not ever, I don't want to talk about training. I don't want to get asked to give lessons again. I just, until I figure this out. And so I dove heavily into that. I dove heavily into the humans. So then I was working at training barns um, specifically to work on the riders and the horses because I thought there would be some correlation. And there is like, you know, this. There's a huge correlation between the holding patterns that are in the horses and the holding patterns that are in the riders. And so then I thought that maybe what I was finding in tension patterns in the horses was just coming from the riders. And some of that's true. Um, but that wasn't all of it either. And so, but I, that was why I dove into that too. And I was like, I have to, <laughs> I have to find these answers. Um, and then I met Catherine Lowry and her and I like, swear to God, she's been my sister in like 10,000 lifetimes. And so we'll just, we, t- we say that we're sisters. Um, but I met her and she's so, an expert so we, at rider biomechanics. Before we go there, go I just want to ask a couple of things. So, so, um, so you, you went back and you took human massage. You went to human yep. massage school mm-hmm. because I know in Washington state, like even a Feldenkrais practitioner has to have a massage license in the state of Washington. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, yep. There. So I am both. Right. So that way, I just wanted to point that out. So then you went to did you do the equine massage school in Washington state? I did. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. So equine school of natural movement. Oh, okay. They're wonderful humans. Yep. So I went through there um, and they were, they were so kind. They're just, they're really great people. The, the Alexander school of um, natural therapeutics is where I went to for the human massage. And then they do bodies and therapy. So it's another off branch of Ida Rolf. Um, right. That's, and, that was the, yeah. Yeah. So that was it. And then my, the owner of the equine school of natural therapy or of natural movement, they're so close. Um, him and his wife were both Heller workers. And so then they took their Heller work into, so technically I'm equine structural integrationist. So I mean, my, my massage license is the same, but it's, it's structural integration on both. And it was not in, I didn't intend for that to happen. I just signed up for the schools that were closest to me. And then that just kind of happened. And then I was like, oh my God, what is the structural integration thing? And the 10 series and Rolfing. And then I, you know, Feldenkrais is a whole other like incredible it's functional thing integration. It's structural and functional integration. They're similar, but they're different, right? Um, right. So if you were to just briefly summarize for someone who's never, oops, oops I just changed my, okay. I, I pressed on my tablet. <laughs> Um, for someone who has never heard of structural integration, how would you define it? 
So structural integration really focuses on posture, which is really where my lens for the horses and what I'm doing now comes from. And so it focuses on when the body and, and fascia. So when the body has a trauma, the fascia will respond to it and kind of place in a holding pattern. And then that holding pattern has an effect on the rest of the body. So if you view fascia as like a full spider web throughout your entire body, if, you know, I get bumped into here or I get an impact and my fascia seizes up here, it's, I'm going to pull up on my left hip or my foot, or, you know, there's, there's coming from other areas. And so the idea is as you go through life and you have these different incidences, you get these fascial holding patterns and it can be even visceral. You can have this in your organs and it kind of cattywampuses your body all out of alignment. And the idea is with a 10 series is that we go through in a specific order, the way that Ida Rolf had designed it, um, to go through a series of movements where we're, it, how do I explain it? Like we put you on the table and when we're releasing the body, we're releasing the body to the posture that you should have. And so if you come in and you're like cranked in this way, we're going to slowly help your body find this relaxation. And then we go through and we release the fascia to that posture. And so by the end of the 10 series, we will have, and sometimes it takes a few, but usually after one solid 10 series, it's incredible because, you know, you'll come in and you'll be like this and, and you won't be able to stand up straight or you'll have these chronic issues. And by the end of it, we'll have unwound so much of the fascial holding patterns that you can regain your normal posture and your normal gait. And that is incredibly healing for the body. You get circulation, you have nerve compression release, you've got emotional release, huge emotional releases because emotions are trapped in the body and fascia. And I mean, you can go as deep as you want to go into it, but it, it is, it is profound work. Um, it absolutely saved me in a lot of things I had. Again, I had had a lot of traumas and a lot of things in my life that, so that when I went to human school, no idea that was what I was getting myself into. Um, but you have to be a demo <laughs> when you're going there. You also have to be worked on when you're going to human massage school. Um, and my instructor used me as a demo a lot because he was like, he used to tell people I was a, I was a very wonderful fake um, because I danced ballet when I was younger. And so I have, I have really good posture. I'm very, you know, I can hold myself well and I was a writer and so I'm strong and I'm very, you know, strong and balanced in the ways that I can be but my body was trashed, like so trashed. Um, and then, you know, and an, another ego eradicating moment for me there is it's like, oh, hey, like I've got, you know, abs of steel and I'm a super strong writer. And I'm like, you know, and he was like, oh, honey, that's none of this. None of this is good. It's like, okay. you just gestured to all of me. <laughs> well, you know, and it's, um, I think the thing, the thing when we were talking the other day that where we really connected is that Ida Rolf and Dr. Feldenkrais were alive at the same time. They were peers. They mm -hmm. were, it, and Feldenkrais, uh, sorry, Alexander was there. It was a period of, in time where there was a, um, a hotbed of new thought in terms of mm -hmm. the human body and the connection between the mind body, right? That was, that was all yep. um, coming out in the fifties and sixties. And so um, their work, their exploration, their, you know, collaboration. I'm, I'm sure that there was some, you know, times when they got together, the, the events that occurred during that period, like Esalen and that sort of thing, where this whole idea of mind-body um, mm -hmm. connection really kind of got its birth, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, your, your roots in the structural integration are similar to my roots of the, you know, in the functional integration with Dr. Feldenkrais. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the thing that um, uh, to me was the connection, so the biggest connection. It was like, oh yeah, we're like, you know, like totally understand. Yeah. Yeah. Totally synergistic. And so, um, I just wanted to, to bring that out because I think it's important. I think it's important for people to understand that, that the, the work that you do has a deep basis in understanding mm -hmm. of structure and function. And the, you know, it goes back to the idea of tensegrity right? That's, right. Uh, and that whole thing that there's a lot of people talking about that stuff now, but the, these people back then were really in the forefront, really at the cutting. They really, un yeah. And I feel, God, I, I you know, I, I would give anything to just like sit on the floor in front of Ida Ralph and be like, can you just talk? <laughs> can I just hear what you, you know, anything you have to say, but yeah. So, you know, speaking on that, one of the, it's, 
I don't use that word often, but that, like, but that's a huge thing. So the integrity and the balance within the body when it's moving. And so my education, and this is, this is pretty typical. So the education for humans is many, many, many more hours than the education for horses in order to be licensed. And so, um, it was really cool. Like, you know, we did a lot of kinesiology in school. And so really understanding movement dynamics and the patterns of gait of, you know, like the implications of gait. So for instance, you know, if you're walking with a limp, like how profound that is on your body for a little, you know, for a limit of time, if you have to have a shorter stride, God forbid, you have to be on crutches, you know, when you have to limit your gait, the way that it adds compensation patterns in your body is incredible. And so it wasn't ever just about, you know, releasing the knots in the body. It was also about how do we restore healthy function and really paying attention to that. And so, you know, it really drove me home for humans. And then, and, you know, that was when that was what the human school is, is really what blew this whole thing wide open because in order to do, so in order to graduate for Washington state, um, our state boards, you also have to go through, um, what's the word? not necessarily like what things to specialize in, but you, you get these little like blips of like a little bit of pediatric and a little bit of, you know, sports medicine and a little bit of spa and a little bit of like, just to see. So then when you graduate, if you want to go out and you, you are technically allowed to do any of these things, but you get enough, you get enough education that you can get a job in any of those fields, but not enough that you can like really know it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then the idea is, is that then you go and you get a job with that person, you specialize, you can take more classes, blah, blah, blah. So I take all these different classes, prenatal, all these different things. And I'm like, these are all neat, but you know, not really for me. And then I did sports med that had, they really specialized in act in like accidents. So, you know, people were in a really bad car wreck, you know, what did they get from that? Or if they were an, an athlete and they had some, you know, tennis elbow or purple tunnel or, you know, all these different things. So that was really fun. So medical massage and um, sports med were like, it, it just lit me up. I thought it would like to be able to like really tangibly fix something was so cool. And I was like, okay, like I can get into this. Um, and I had had a compound fracture in my arm that then developed frozen shoulder and mm-hmm. thoracic outlet syndrome. And I'd gone through PT. I'd gone through all those things. I had maybe 55% of my range of motion back. And they were like, that's the best we're ever going to do. And when I went through, I know, I know, I know (laughs) shooting, shooting nerve pain all the time, but it's okay. That's just the best that we're going to, you know, that's, you know, it's great. You're good. You've graduated from PT. And I'm like, what is your metric for graduation? Um, so, (laughs) but when I went to school, he fixed it in like three sessions using me as a demo. It wasn't even like an actual, like whatever, but just doing like the demo sessions on rotator cuff injuries on me he completely fixed it. And I was like, what is this magic? This is the coolest thing I've ever seen. So I dove into that quite a lot, quite a lot. And because of my own experience, I just fell in love with working on everything related to thoracic outlet syndrome. I thought that that was the most cool, profound thing that you could do for pretty much every human body. Um, almost every single human body that I work on has touches of like where it could happen, whether it's coming from the psoas or their feet, or if it's coming from up in their neck. And it's, it's so easy for us to get entrapment in that area from stress, from traumas, from posture that we have. And then, so I got really good at that. And my human business like blew up and I got very well known for that. And doctors would refer to me all the time for it. And then at some point, this little like switch went off in my brain. And I was like, oh shit, like all, all this time, like these, like these patterns that I'm seeing with the horses. And I was like, oh my God, you know, that moment where you're like, you're an idiot. You've been doing, you know, no, it's okay. Because and, and you're not, to, you know, the, all of that experience led you to that moment. Right. And, and right. if you hadn't had all that experience, it wouldn't necessarily have led you to that moment. So, you know, for me, it was, I had vertigo for years and I went and had three sessions with my Feldenkrais teacher and it was gone after I'd spent I don't know how many hours in PT that did right. nothing. Right. It's this I have life changing. Yeah. And then you're like, oh MG, you know what? what? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, fully. And so then and, and I'd been working in a clinic for a while doing this and I was also working on the weekends on the horses and I just hadn't quite put two and two together yet. And so when that went off in my brain, I was like, oh my God. And then I came home and I'm like pulling out all of my anatomy books on both humans and horses. And I was like, 
the nerves are the same. Like yeah, yeah. we also have a brachial plexus. They also have a brachial plexus and we have this and they have this. And I'm like tracing it. And I was like, cause you don't, we, none of that was on my state boards for the horses. Like you didn't have to learn any of that. Um, not to the extent that you had to learn for the humans anyway, at, at any stretch of the imagination. So I'm like looking into this and then I'm like Googling like a psychopath about, you know, brachial plexus impingement and thoracic outlet syndrome in horses. And I'm like Googling anything that I can buzz about, nothing, zero, there's nothing. And I'm like, there's, that is, that is no way that that is true. There's no way that there's, what is going on here? So I had a whole moment about that. Um, you know, but and it's so again, interesting was, because it was your own experience, right? Fully. It was yeah. your own experience that, and I think that that's what people, um, it comes from our experience. It comes from the things that happened. Mm -hmm. Like Feldenkrais would always say, health is the ability to recover. You know, mm -hmm. it's because it's if, you, if, you, if you never have an insult, where's the opportunity to learn? Yeah. If you never fall down, where do you learn how to get back up? Right. Yeah. Um, and that's so, true. you know, it's, it, that's why I like, I like doing this because it's so fascinating. What led you to this? Well, all, yeah. all, all of this life led you to this moment to go, wait a second. This is the same as a horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? And I was like, it's, and, it is and the same thing in a way that no one else has in a lens that no one else has looked at. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's yeah. where that that's the magic, right? Yeah. And it, it is hard to explain that to people. And I tried to, and I'm like, we all, we all have our own lenses and we all have our own special gifts. And, you know, I joke about it and be like, my ADHD just allows me to hyper-focus on certain things. And, you know, therein lies my gift, but it's the, it is that it's, it is exactly that. And so I have a very different lens on how I see the body. And it's been fascinating over the years to get to meet different like-minded individuals yourself included where I'm like oh my gosh like we're both like we're chasing the same thread and we're working on the same body so there should be some right like it'd be silly if there wasn't anything right. but it's so fun to find these different people that are doing just these little like different aspects so I got I'd figured I figured that out and then I started using my manual techniques from humans onto the horses for the nerve release and the the results were incredible. Like, I mean, and again, I've been working on horses for several years at this point and like good, you know, like did a good enough job, but it wasn't like I could take these horses that had necks that were just absolute concrete. And within 10, 15 minutes, they would just be jello and butter because you would get these, these nerve root issues or nerve compression issues resolved. And then the horse could fully just let go. And then, you know, then that sends me onto the thing. I'm like, so if the horse's neck, I don't, I'm going to, I don't remember the quote, but my human instructor said something along the lines of, you can find a lot of, you, you, you learn a lot about the body by finding out like what their references or what they try to go to. And so something in that was really profound for me when I was working on the horses next. And I was seeing these changes because so much, so many horses, so many horses have such chronic tension in their necks and shoulders, particularly through their ventral neck. That then with just a, you know, a few minutes of these nerve release techniques, it would just be jello. So the horse's default wants to be loose. It doesn't want to be seized up. And that, I mean, that's just what I hyper-focused on. And I was like, okay, like it, if it wants to do this, then why, why are they so seized up when we're riding them? Like what's going on? And it, you know, and it's just, there are so many, there are so many threads I could lead you down. It just depends on which one you want me to go, but it's okay. We can, you know, we, I have time. Um, so, you know, and this is where, you know, a friend of mine wrote a song one time and it was go back. How far, how, how mm. far back do you want to go to, to see, to unwind it? You, you know, you'd have to go back to the beginning. You have to go back yeah. to the beginning because the story starts from the beginning and it's, it's all of our, uh, you know people think wow you just like magically no you didn't magically come up with this you came magically. up with this through all of this <laughs> experience and all of these different breeds and mm. looking at, at doing all these different things and then just following your passion until mm. you, you know come up a, a light bulb goes on and, mm -hmm. there isn't and it really and it really does happen like that like it's just one day something goes ching and you're like oh my god really <laughs> well, surefoot took 15 seconds 
That was my ding right. in seconds, right? Yeah. I totally get this. I totally it might've taken, you know, it took a whole, you know, four lifetimes leading up to it to really get it. But yeah, the actual thing that came in, you're like, oh, that's, I got it. I understand. I understand now. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and I go back all the time to something that my foster, you know, my foster dad would teach me these things on horses and I had absolutely no reverence for what it was that he was teaching until 20 years later. And I'm sitting on a horse and I'm like, that's why we did this. Okay. I got it. I'm tracking yeah. a little slow, but I'm no, here. no, because at that age, you actually don't have the, de- the brain development to process no. it on that level. So you can't. Yeah right? If you process it on a motor level, this is, you know, when I teach, I always tell people, but it planted a seed. Exactly. You know, if you have Mm -hmm. an experience, you have a motor pattern and that motor pattern suddenly connects with the intellect so that you can understand it at a different level. Yep. You're like, let me break it down for you a little bit. Um, no, that, no, that's exactly it. So, so as a structural integrationist, I was like, cool. So I can release these tension patterns that now I firmly are believing that it's coming from nerve compression and everybody's telling me that I'm bananas crazy about this. And that's fine. They can say that. I think that this is what's going on because this is the same feeling that I'm feeling in my hands with the humans that I know from medical reporting is nerve compression. So I know that that's going on for humans and it feels the same in the horses. So this is what I think is going on. And then it again, it's not good enough to just release it. So why is it getting like that? Why, why is this happening? And so then I had the opportunity to bring in a horse for rehab, um, who had chronic neck and shoulders, chronic lower lumbar, chronic hamstrings, pretty chronic stifles. And it was what I consider now to be a very normal compensatory pattern. Like, it, like now I, I would look at that and I'd be like, oh, it's a piece of cake. At the time, it was very, very complicated because I hadn't put all the pieces quite together yet. But I knew that she was suffering from a lot of chronic back pain. And I knew that she was suffering from a lot of nerve compression in her neck and shoulders. And she was being, she'd bucked off her rider, rider had gotten injured. Um, and I'd worked on this mare for over a year. She was really sweet. She loved her job. She's a jumper. She was not malicious at all, but she would have these bucking fits. And so they were going to send her out to a a cowboy, um, to ride her through it and to, you know, get her attitude in check and things like that. And her owner is a very, very sweet, good friend of mine now. And, and I was the first time, (laughs) it was so funny. It was so scary. It was the first time that I was like, so, um, I used to be a horse trainer (laughs) and I've, I'm your trusted body worker now. And I have a theory that these things are going on. And I think that I might be able to help her just with body work and some like light rehab stuff. Would you consider doing this instead of sending her to a cowboy? Cause I really don't think that it's a behavior that's naughty. I think that she's in discomfort. And she was like, Oh my God. Yeah. Like, absolutely. And I'm like, okay, that was really scary. (laughs) We'll do that. And then she came over. Um, and I, I got to practice with her and I got to practice. What would it be like to like open the shoulders and get the shoulders off of the thing? What different postures? And I just, you know, I had her for about three or four, I think four months total. And her transformation was incredible. And I still, even then I didn't quite fully understand what I understand now. And that was just a few years ago. Um, but the, the essence of it is, is how can we get these horses? How can we move them? How can we train them? How can we work with them in our, in our training practices, written and otherwise, in a way that is actively decompressing the shoulders off of the brachial plexus? And then when that happens, the horse is able to find relief because they're not suffering from nerve compression. And then their ventral neck really lets go. Their back then lets go their hind end really lets go, their quads come online. So then they stop having stifle issues. All of these, it was like all of these things went away just by playing with the shoulders and and relieving that nerve compression. And so, you know, and then, and what was cool about it too, is so the, the level at which she was jumping and competing wasn't super high. And then at the end of just four months of rehab, she ended up going back like two or three times way beefier jump like her jumping was better her her she had a nice soft walk to canter transition her lead changes were smooth like all of these things were fine 
And it was like, here, I thought I was, you know, my horse was a deficit and we were just going to bring her back, but she actually like got so much better and it was really cool. She's the, if anybody's seen like the before and after of the gray mare jumping, that was, that was karma. And it was just so cool to see that. And then I got into this belief, not, I mean, not got into it, but it changed from just caring about releasing the body to how do we develop it correctly to do the job that it's supposed to be doing. And so that's, um, that's kind of the, what changed the trajectory of everything. And that's still what we, what I do today is it's how do we develop the body so that the horse is able to stay in a parasympathetic state, which I know you and I can really nerd out. Oh, on we could go on about that forever. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so that they don't have these terrible compensatory patterns that most horses that we see and work on have. And it is annoyingly simpler than it should be. And I think that that is why it is really hard sometimes for people to wrap their minds around. Um, because it's not as, it's really not as hard as the world has made it out to be. (laughs) Uh, No, I, I, I don't disagree with you. Um, you know, we're, uh, okay. So 15 seconds (laughs) totally changed my life with Surefoot, right? Right. Uh, So if it's that hard, then how come people are doing that all over the place? It's not. Our mindset is the thing that that is difficult because we have traditions in our industry and Mm. we've been told this is the way it is. And so, you know, it's such a, um, and you know, it. it's such a conflict with our own self image that if, how can it be that simple? Right. We've been told it's not that simple. We've been told to have feel you have to do, you know, it's going to be hard and to train. It's all going to be hard and it's going to take a long time and you may never get good enough. I mean, when you think about our industry as a whole, most people are told they're never going to be good enough. Right. Oh, truly. Right. I I know. Yes. I know, you know, like it goes back to the Irish instructor who didn't bother to tell you you were good enough. And that's why she was hard on you. She was just hard on you. You didn't know you were good. No, no, I really thought all the, and I, and it's funny and she, and, you know, and she thought that that was fine and normal, but the whole time, I mean, I absolutely thought that I was just horrible. Like I was never going to be good enough. I mean, and I wrote, I wrote with, oh, all probably most of them. Um, And they shouldn't. (laughs) Right. Like I, when I teach pony club, well, actually I do it with adults too. I'll, I'll walk up and then, what do you do well? And they go, um, Mm. and you know, I mean, the whole what do it's you like do how many people even know the answer to that? Yeah, they do. They, but they, if I say, "What do you do badly?" I can't sit the trot. I can't. Can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. I was like, right. "Whoa, wait a second. <laughs> you know, yeah. how do we? You know, that's we're focusing on the things you you can't do, but you don't even know the first thing you can. Know do. What you can do? Yeah, I know. That's crazy. We could go down that rabbit hole. Let's not. But, but it is, and, you know, and there is a difference between it being simple and it being easy. Right. And so we can kind of start playing in with the nervous system a little bit. So what I have found, I'll throw one more tidbit of a story, because this is kind of profound and it leads back for me and it leads back to kind of the work with the Mustangs. So if you want to take anything, if you want to learn about a subject, in my opinion, the best thing to do is to learn from the subject. (laughs) You should learn from trainers and you should get advice from things, but you really, you know, when we're talking about a living, breathing, dynamic being such as a horse, it's not, I don't think you're ever fully going to get the story unless you're genuinely sitting with that horse and that particular horse, right? It's not just a horse. And I think, you know, in this industry, we have a lot of like, we're going to take riding lessons and we're going to learn how to ride horses. I will tell you that every single horse that I get on is a completely different contract than the one before. It is not the same. And so while my skills as a rider come to the table, the way that I have to change my ask and change my feel and change the conversation horse to horse to horse is very different. And most, most of us more upper level riders, I think can agree with that. Um, but it's not talked about in that way. And so similarly for learning about like rehab and anatomy and, and, and different things, you can read a book on equine exercises and equine rehabilitation, but that might not work for that horse that you're working with. And it's one of the things that I love so much about how you have designed Surefoot and like, you know, I was flipping through that, your workbook. And I was like, this is so brilliant. Like the questions that you're leading them to 
is specifically to like, what is going on with that particular horse? How is this particular horse going to respond to this? It's not just some blanket statement of, you know, put them on the sure foot pads for 20 minutes every other day. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't that, work that way. <laughs> and, and my work doesn't work that way. And the one thing that I will endlessly get heat for is that I just don't punch out an exercise and say, do this with your horse for this amount of time. And then all will be well, I'd make a shit ton of money if I did that. I mean, I've got a decent following. I could cut up some videos. I could put it out there and say, here you go. And I would never be able to live with myself or sleep at night because it would not be correct for, you know, however many horses yeah. you have to learn how for the one horse you designed it for. Right. Exactly. And it's like, but I can teach you a checklist to go through and I can teach you, you know, a general guideline of questions of which you can play with. And, but it has to be a very consensual open conversation with your horse on, you know, are they, are they okay with this? And the other thing that that, so that's not common in the industry. The industry is very much about like, do this, like these regimented exercises. And it's very, you know, Formulaic. I'm going to check the boxes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's, that, that's not real life on how it works for the horse, in my opinion. And the other thing that that plays into is that it doesn't leave any leeway of conversation to make sure that the horse is in a good emotional state. And I know that that can be up for interpretation for a lot of people, but if you're learning about emotional states and posture, our bodies will relax when we are in a parasympathetic state in a specific way. Humans are like this too. Horses are very similar in the musculature that sees up. So if you're in, as a human, if you're in a flight response, your scalenes specifically are going to seize up, it's going to restrict your diaphragm, your psoas is going to restrict usually your quads as well. So you kind of have this like ding, 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 ding that kind of sees up and that is your, I might die. <laughs> it happens when you're driving and somebody slams on the brake in front of you. It happens when you trip and you almost fall down the stairs. It happens when you're in an actual dangerous situation. Your body doesn't, can't, it's not going to be like, oh, this wasn't actually going to kill you. It's like, no, they're all saber tooth tigers. And the way that your body responds to that is drops you into that sympathetic state. The reverse is, op is true for being in a parasympathetic state. So if you have the opportunity to get, you know, if you are somebody that really likes touch and you have the opportunity to go and get a really nice, lovely, quiet massage, and you get to kind of get into that state, that's lovely. If you're not a touch person, maybe going for a swim, like there's different things, right. That can, can elicit that receiving energy from a human, but the muscles that are on and off, depending on what state you're in do that. And it's the same thing for the horses. So when the horses are in a flight response and, and, and that is also true for like pain. So if you're limping or if you're seized up, or if I'm in a little bit more pain than normal, my scalings are going to be a little bit seized up. My breathing is going to be a little bit restricted because I don't feel that, um, that relaxation to take a full breath. So for horses, when they're in a sympathetic state, their brachiocephalicus is on their iliopsoas is on and their hamstrings are on. So because they're a quadruped, they're more hamstring dominant, we're quad dominant. Um, but that's basically the only real difference. And so when you're playing around with these horses and you're watching what muscles they're using and when and why, what I found to be true, and this is through my horse that passed away, but, um, and from the Mustangs that I worked with, is when a horse is in a true parasympathetic state, they are more sound. And that's, again, what one of the surefoot things gets to play with, right, is we're playing with these horses and we're getting them onto, they're, they're able to find a parasympathetic state when in the majority of their lives, they might not have gotten to feel that. And so you have a horse that was not sound and then you put them into this parasympathetic state. And so their muscles get to rearrange and their balance gets to rearrange and then they walk off of it and they walk off sounder than they walked on. And it's because they were able to let go of those chronic tension patterns that they were holding because they had been in this sympathetic state for so long. My dragon horse was an ex-Mexican dancing horse. And he, I mean, and he had just a slew of issues. I mean, he had huge box bobbins. He had like his day-to-day, -day, like he wasn't in the, the pain response that we ended up finding that he, he wasn't, um, he didn't show pain like normal, but he was very neurotic and he was in, he was extremely aggressive to other horses. And I had called in, there were vets from UC Davis. I had every specialized body worker in the area see him. I had some specialized trainers come down and mess with him. And they were like, you know, he's just, he's got, he's got something. And he ended up, what had happened is he had a really botched gelding job. 
Um, he was a crypt orchid. They did a horrific job on him. They did not open him up and do the abdominal surgery. They like shoved their whole arm up through where his testicle was and tried to bad, like next level bad. So he got cleared by everybody for not having any discomfort, including body work, because there wasn't anything that was wrong with him that we could find, but it was internal. It was his gelding scar. So he had such significant gelding scarring that it um, impacted his lumbosacral plexus and his iliopsoas. So he got stuck in a sympathetic state because of all of the tension patterns that were going on. It That fascia pulled down and it just locked over. So we had essentially chronic sciatica, but nobody knew. He had, um, because that was seized up in the flow from the diaphragm up through the neck, it also had vagus nerve dysfunction, right? Sure. So you've got all these different things that are going on that checked. I mean, I cannot tell you the number of specialists that signed off that he was fine. And I just kept chasing and chasing and chasing. And, you know, it, it's one of those, like, you know, you want to, I got to a point where I was going to put him down because I felt so bad that he would have these neurotic episodes, but there wasn't an answer aside from the fact that he was just crazy. And I'm like, but he's not though, because I know him and there's, he doesn't have this. And then, and so when we finally started, it was an animal communicator that was like, should try to give him banamine. And then we like lasered in that it was in the gelding scar area. And then that whole story came out. I was able to track down the vet that did it and heard that horror story. And I was like, okay. Um, and at the time that we found this, nobody was doing, I'd never even heard of gelding scar. Like that wasn't, that yeah. wasn't even a conversation and, that was had. Right. right. And so, it's still not, not wildly popular in conversation. Let's just put it No, that. no, but there are some vets now, at least that like specialize, right? Like there's, there's some osteopaths in Florida and I think there's one in California as well that they, they specialize in doing, um, gelding scar removals and like there at least it's a conversation among professionals that it, like nothing was coming up and so we played around with a lot of that but when it so what I watched with him though because I would go out and I would just watch him I mean hours every day I would just sit and I would watch and I'd observe because the behaviorist in me was trying to figure this out because it wasn't definitely wasn't normal and it was so intermittent and I didn't know what his triggers were because it wouldn't be like a mare would come on the, there wasn't like a specific trigger it would just happen and so I was watching him one day and he, a truck went by that was really loud and he seized up and he went into a slight reflex and he seized up his brachiosphalicus, which now what I know seizes up their iliopsoas. So it really crunched on top of that pain that he already had. And then it sent him into that spiral. So I watched him essentially swap nervous systems and then swap his, the musculature on what was working in his body. And he was just dead lame. He was in so much pain. He was also completely neurotic. It spun this whole episode. And so what I did was I got him out and I, I used to totally use cookies for bribery. But I was like, this, this didn't happen when he was relaxed in his neck and when his lower back was relaxed. So I took him out with a cookie and I basically just had him chase me around in what I now call pillar one. But I had him follow me around in that posture that got his brachiocephalicus off. And he walked, you know, a couple laps and it was not that much longer after that, that he just completely melted and he was fine. He was sound all of the nerve. Like none, I didn't, <laughs> we're talking hours that this horse would spiral and pace and sweat and dance. And he would do like this fake Mexican pee off from what they did to him. And it all went away within a few minutes of getting him to walk in a posture that was conducive to bringing him back to a parasympathetic state. And I was like, Okay. I don't know what this is, but okay, <laughs> I will, I will chase this until I'm dead in the ground. Um, and it fired on, then I, you know, you have those, those light bulbs of experiences. And I remembered all the Mustangs that I got to work with and watch out in the wild, the ones that would come in with like heavily, like, like the old ones, the ones that were like really scarred up, the ones that you, like, they definitely been through it had significant hypertrophy in their under neck and over their low back and their hamstrings. I mean, just insane overdevelopment and scars on it. And I was like, holy shit. So those muscles, I bet serve as protector muscles, which is fine if you're not being ridden. Correct. <laughs> okay. So if you're just being a horse. And not so fine when you are. <laughs> right. So when you're just being a horse and you're grazing, 
and your entire job is to meander about and graze and lift your head up and then run for short spurts to protect yourself and then go back to grazing, it's not a big deal. It's fine. You're totally fine. Not to say that Mustangs don't have health and lameness and soundness issues. Like I'm sure they do to an extent, but not anything that we see with like the domesticated horses. And so, you know, in Dragon's instance, he had gone back and forth from, you know, people trying to make him a dressage horse, which was ridiculous, to Mexican dancing horse. And so he'd had a lot of very, very, very heavy riding and heavy circles and, and tied up and his head tied to his hocks and just unimaginable things happened to him. Meanwhile, he's being ridden in the sympathetic state also having this fascial scarring now over that lumbosacral plexus and it's like well it's no wonder that he would completely spiral but um yeah that that fixed it and then I yeah that that's that's all I've chased and so my entire business now that the balanced movement method the pillars the exercises that I do all of it um off of that core principle that the horse must be in what I call a receiving energy, the horse must be in a parasympathetic state, or it doesn't matter what exercises you're doing because they're using the wrong muscles. Mm -hmm. It has to come from the nervous system. So, yeah. so you've had a little chance to play with Surefoot just to see what that does. Yes. And I'm, I'm really curious. I know that you've had some bad weather, so you haven't had a lot of time to play with it. I don't horrible weather. I've also had a, a very busy, moderately rough week, um, but I did get to pull it out and play with. I have a new guy in, well, I shouldn't say he's not like Brando. I've had him for a few months. He's mine. I own him. Um, and he's a dressage rehab and he's got all kinds of interesting complications. And he also has pretty significant high, low, it's terrible feet, but he has significant high, low. We're working on it. And what was cool was he has a really hard time balancing. I, I started talking about this before, but so I started trimming my own horse's feet. It's a long story. Um, it's where but, we all wind up in the end, okay? It's where we all wind up. Um, so here I am doing something that I neither have the time nor the qualifications to be doing, but I have fantastic mentors that are helping me and laughing with me along the way. And, but one of the things that I've noticed from now a trimming lens is like my horses can, can hold up for a little while for like, you know, me picking them out or doing like the normal day-to-day -day things. But especially because I'm very, very new at this. So I'm a little slow when I'm trimming, they're having to hold it up longer than normal. And um, he struggles heavily standing up on the foot that is clubbed. He really has a hard time. So when I'm working on his low heel, he's like, he just, he's all, all wavy on it. And when I was playing with the sure foot pads, when he put his weight on so he was weighted on his clubbed, but he would put his weight on the sure foot pad in the other one. He had the most amazing bout of releases. He was like, this is the coolest thing ever. And you could just watch him just like sink all into it. He wasn't ready to put his hinds on it, but his hinds are a whole other touchy story. Um, but, but that's what I loved about your thing. You're like, just put him on and let him take it off, put him on and take it off. And so he played with it for a minute because he's a very dainty dressage horse and we don't touch things. It's very scary, um, but he worked through it. And then he got on it and he was like, oh, oh. Oh, and you just watched him like just settle into it, but it took him a minute to like rebalance and to, to play with it. And so we were talking about how you had the other, the other pads are the ones that are designed for the trimming. So when I trim, I'm going to use that one to see if it helps him stand up longer. Cause it's so interesting to feel how they, they have to shift their whole body around in order to, to make that happen. And no wonder farriers have such a hard time. And I work on a lot of farriers and I will tell you that their bodies are arguably the worst ones to work on. Yeah, they have a really And now I know why. <laughs> yeah, they have a really tough job and if the horse is uncomfortable, their job just got exponentially harder, right? So much harder. So and, much harder. Yeah, so the whole the physiopad was we specifically a lot of people we changed the name from fairy to physiopad because so many other people were using it, but that pad was specifically yeah. designed for them. And we have uh trimmers and farriers using that all over the world and um it's really, so cool. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so cool. But yeah, so that, so that was my experience is I got to watch him rebalance. But when he rebalanced, he put himself into pillar one. It was beautiful. He just went right into it and just like whole brachiocephalic S went off. His whole jugular groove was kicking in. Like everything was great. And I was like, this is awesome. That's so good. It's great. Well, I, I'm looking forward to you playing with the pads more. Um, Me too. Getting your feedback. I think that's going to be really, really fun. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that when I come out that way we get to to get together because I think that would be Fully. really fun. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think that we should absolutely I think that we will nerd out to to 
no end with both of that. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, and that was the thing that I just really fell in love with when we were talking on the phone is when you started talking about the nervous system and how that was why this whole thing came to play in. And I was like, oh my God, we're doing the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. Well, because, you know, as we said- Somebody you know, doesn't think I'm crazy. <laughs> no, no, the nervous system's where it's at. You know, it's like, um, you you know, that's Dr. Feldenkrais's home. You can't think a thought without a movement, right? Mm. It's all based on the nervous system. And, um, you know, it's hard for people to- wrap their brain they want a a more physical they want to think about muscles and more physicality because we've right. we've been led to believe that that we that that's the way it has to work but actually when the nervous system is really doing its job it's elegant and that's the piece that the horses yeah. we have to get back to is the elegance the ease well and i think that's one of the things that makes this, you know, journey of horsemanship so beautiful is because, you know, we're all trying to figure out how to, to be a good horseman and how to show up for the horses the best way. And, you know, when you go back and I'd mentioned this in some of the posts that I'd written, but I am not, I never read any classical literature, like classical dressage literature, but I, as I would teach people and I was teaching the pillars and I was going out to different dressage barns, they were like, this is like what, you know, so-and-so said like a hundred years ago. And there's like these little threads that are very, very similar. And they're like, they didn't explain it in this way and they weren't naming muscles, but this was, I think the idea of what they were trying to go for. But now we have the anatomy and kinesiology and the imaging and like all the cool stuff now. So it's a little bit easier, I think, to find. Um, but watching the crossover of classical dressage versus what I'm teaching is so, so, so similar. It's just the the main difference being, and this is where it's a lot easier said than done, is you can say that you're focused on, say, you know, having the horses like relaxation, but what does relaxation mean to you? Does relaxation mean what it means to me? Or does relaxation mean that your horse just isn't fighting you? Because a horse can be in a sympathetic musculature state and not be fighting you. It can just be, you right. know, kind of going around and still doing it. And so it's kind of clarifying what these terms mean. Um, saying that you want the horses like the base of the neck relaxed well that brachiocephalicus it's it starts down here but it also goes up and attached to the upper end right and so if a horse is loose down here but a little behind the vertical it's seized up up here if it's loose down here but it's a little bit up and seized up here the center of gravity is up there it's seized up in that one so that full muscle is still quite engaged and so with my work and my research what i have found to be true um is that that muscle is antagonistic to the thoracic sling. So it's why you get such good results with the thoracic sling. It's why I get such good results with the thoracic sling is because my exercises are very good and they're very specific, but they're all geared around, is that muscle off? Are they in a parasympathetic state? And they, you cannot force it off. You cannot tie it. You cannot use side reins. You cannot use draw reins. I've used all of these things before, by the way, I know vehemently understanding, you know, what's going on with all that, but you can't force it because it is completely 100% up to if the horse feels safe in its environment to do it. Absolutely. If the horse is safe in its body to let go. So if they have chronic feet, if they have, you know, severe arthritis, maybe they won't be able to let go. If there's some underlying pathology, they're not going to let go. And that's fine. Like use that then as a diagnostic. Um, so there's all these different, these avenues to look at, but once you start genuinely understanding and seeing the horse in this lens where the nervous system and the way that the, and the way that that creates how they move and how they develop through their bodies, you very quickly can understand the patterns of why some horses are, most horses have no thoracic sling and a very negative angled spine and chronic pain in their lower lumbar and kissing spines and stifle issues. All of that stems from this, in my opinion, this one thing where it comes from, we are kind of bulldozing them past where they're ready. We're saying, hey, we're going to get on and walk track canner, but is the horse developed to do that? No, if they're not developed, then they're going to go into a sympathetic state to try to make it happen. And now you've just lost. And will the horses train? Can they get trained? Absolutely. I've trained many of them in that way, most of my life. Um, and again, like they were happy enough, but they weren't that the way that they develop in that way is then what causes nerve compression issues. So now we have lameness issues that are undiagnosed and we can't figure out what's going on and they're not blocking and we like don't understand what all these problems are coming from. Um, or they 
they block because it's compensatory pain that's been caused by something else. So you try to solve the pain that's not really the cause of the pain. Right. So the referral of the pain or the mm -hmm. additional compensation. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, and then you've done it for long enough, and I'm sure you, you can attest to this too, but once you've done this for a while and you've seen all of these countless thousands and thousands of bodies with this lens, you're like, it's the same thing. <laughs> you know, it's just like pull the string and do this one and come up. And it's, you know, the, the wide array of implications that happen from it are, are vast, but it ends up being relatively simple and it's, it are the same thing. So the first thing that we do with every single horse that comes in through the program, whether, you know, you're going through my master class or the horses in training or what, whatever it is, the first thing that we do is we do the work to what is it going to take to get this horse into a parasympathetic state? And a lot of times that has to do with the handler more than the horse. <laughs> I put What's, a lot of people on sure foot pads while they're standing in their I uh, bet you do. Um, <laughs> And it, and you know, and that's a whole other conversation. And so you can't be out and be like, I need you to relax because in 20 minutes, I have 20 minutes to get this done. It's like that. Well, that just went up the window, didn't it? <laughs> you know? Um, so it is a, it is a, it is a culture shift that has to happen um, in our mindset. And, you know, I mean, my God, like in our defense as humans, how often do we get to be in a parasympathetic state? How often do we get to be in a receiving energy how often do we get to not do this like bam, 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 nine to five traffic, drop the kids off, get the food, you know, cook the meals, get it. Like we, our society is structured so much in that way that it doesn't surprise me that we now have put that onto our horses, but our horses don't know that, you know, they don't understand. Yeah. One of the fun things about when I do a surefoot workshop and I have to be careful because the horses all let down and I watch all mm -hmm. the people and, and. I lose the, I mean, they're all like drooling, you know, and it's like, okay, <laughs> we can't do more here. They're like, we want to do, it's like, I can't do more with you. You're all piles of ghee. And um, yeah, um, but that's, you know, and that you're absolutely right. It's the people we're, we've gotten into such a heightened state that we don't even know what that is. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we can, uh, if we can find it together with our horses. Yes. And, and that's what makes it so beautiful too, is like when you can experience connection at that level, oh my goodness, it's so cool. And I think that that's, you know, that's, that's what people chase. And that's why we do it is because, you know, when you can get that level of connection with an animal, especially there's something about horses, they're so grounding and they're so wise. And so in order to have that relationship with them, it's pretty, it's pretty special. Yeah. So um, Stephanie says, this is the thing that is so important and unique about your work, Celeste. I'm so appreciative of your approach and not one size fits all. Um, mm -hmm. It's so it's just so common sense. And yet so few in the industry present their work like this, you know, and that's that's I don't know why. It's because you get hated when you do it. <laughs> no, no. You know, I, OK, so. So I don't know what generation you are, but if you've ever read Jonathan Livingston Seagull and the seagull that flew in the other direction from the flock, right? I have not, but I feel like I should purchase this. Okay. <laughs> and read it to your children because it's a great story, right? Jonathan Livingston Seagull is very, it's old. I date myself. But the other book okay. that, that Richard Bach wrote was called Illusions by Illusions. And it's, mm. it's talking about, you know, it's all right here. Like, um, it's all here. It's a question of focusing the lens. And if the mm -hmm. lens isn't focused, yeah. you don't see it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, your story is the perfect example of that in that, you know, it was there, but it wasn't until the lens focused on it in a certain way that the light bulb went off. Yep. And that's yeah. so true of, a, you know, so many people in their lives. Like I talked to, you know, I've talked to a lot of people um, and it's, um, you know, it's, what was that moment that, that deciding moment that you either had to persevere or something happened, or, you know, mm. in my case, I had a horrendous accident or, you know, what is it about life that leads us in a certain way? And then we suddenly, you know, my, my, I have a, you know, uh, overnight success, 20 years in the making. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. truly. I mean, and, and it is, you know, like you'll get some of that. We're like, oh, well, this is just an overnight thing. And I'm like, I mean, it kind of seemed that way because by the time I had, you know, actually like packaged it and presented it and like done these things, like now, now it's, now it's easy. And now it's, you know, being really well received globally and all this is great. Great. But I mean, my God, it was. Yeah. You and I could have <laughs> lots of stories about not acceptance in the beginning. 
<laughs> quite the thing. I remember, God, the year before all of this took off, I got fired like right before Christmas too. And it like costs, I mean, like we didn't know how we were going to pay bills. Like it was pretty brutal because once you like start really understanding this stuff, it's very, um, well, I, I specifically have a really hard time keeping my mouth shut when I'm like, that's not, that's not right. So then these people would hire me to come out and work on their horses and they just wanted me to do band-aids. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I cannot just do a band-aid. I can, I will work on the horses and I can show you these things to help you. And if you just tweak a little bit about how you're riding them, I think it would be a lot easier, but now I'm coming at it now, you know, now I'm competitive and now I'm, you know, just some other trainer trying to steal their clients. And I'm like, no, I don't want any clients. I just want you to, (laughs) I I don't want to do band-aids anymore. And so to go from, you know, being told I was crazy and that this didn't make any sense and that it didn't exist and that nerve issues weren't real and getting fired and being broke as shit to then, you know, to now in a very short amount of time, it's actually kind of, I mean, it's a little weird. It's a little bit of a twilight zone, but I appreciate it. Um, so I didn't read the comment, but somebody flashed up Audrey DeClue. So yeah. then it was like halfway through after the masterclass, I saw that name and I got on her podcast and I binged her stuff and I felt so much less alone in the world. <laughs> and I was like, somebody else is talking about the brachial plexus. It's so cool. I was so excited. And it was like, this is real. Somebody says that it's a real and she has shiny letters after her name, even better. Like this is good. <laughs> And well, and I think that Davis that's what, our, that you know, what I see happening now is it's about collaborating with people that are coming from a similar perspective. And there, you, mm-hmm. you and I have people in our spheres that are similar um, uh, or the same, actually. Um, and and yeah. it, and it's slowly starting to happen where you know it's gonna it's gonna pick up. It because, is gonna pick up. You know, but it's a it's a huge shift, and it's like. In some ways, Surefoot is kind of a little easier because it's so out of the box. They don't have anything they can go back to, right? Um, yeah. We don't have a history of it. So in some ways, it's easier. In some ways, it's harder because it's so so over there. Whereas right. coming from a perspective of a trainer and you're saying, hey, you're not training your horse in a way that's, they're like, what do you mean? I'm a trainer. I'm success- I got all this on the wall. Right? I know. I know. I know. Yeah. No, I know, you know, I'm talking, I'm preaching the choir here, right? Yeah. And it's just, you know, and and it's hard. And and I know that because I was that trainer too. Right. And it's like, I understand like my metric of success has changed so much from what it used to be. Um, And that is a hard thing to change. And, you know, and trainers need to also get their bills paid and they have to put food on the table. And so, you know, you have this idea of, so as a, as a competitive trainer, I, you know, it was scary to navigate that, which is also why it was probably easier for me to just be like, I'm just not going to do this anymore until I can figure it out. Um, because now when people come to train with me, they understand where I come from. Like the, this is my, this is my ethos. This is how we do things. This is how I'm going to set up your horse. It's very, very, very clear versus if they came to me in the past, they were coming to me because they had a competition goal and they wanted me to help them meet it. And we were going to do that, you know, yeah, because that that was the goal. Whereas now my goal is firmly in believing, you know, like, is, is your horse, does your horse want to do this? Are they in a receiving energy? Are you able to, you know, teaching people how to pick up on those cues, how to invite the horse into that, and then how that grows from there. And it's just like, it's so incredible. And it's so profound. And it's very simple. But it is a huge shift in the lens. And, you know, to go at it and be like, well, you're training your horses wrong, that doesn't work right? Because what is wrong? Well, my horses are fine. They're not lame and they're winning. So I don't need this. And yeah, so, so, so um, Carol saying, what is that saying? It says first new things are ridiculed, denounced, then accepted, then become the norm. You girls are leading edge <laughs> soon to be the norm. I'm hoping <laughs> soon to be the norm. We're going for it, man. We're, we are, we are showing up. We are showing up and trying. And that is all that counts. I mean, and at the end of the day though, it's like the horse, the, the bodies don't lie. So if a horse is, you know, sitting doing my work and all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're so happy. And again, you know, like with my horse that I told you about, and we haven't, so I'm sorry, I have like 30 tabs open in my brain. So I'm like, which one am I picking from here? Um, so like my guy that I got him to come down from his like crazy, um, his episodes is what we would call them by bringing him into a parasympathetic state and then watching his entire body transform 
as that happened was like, holy crap, this is so cool. But so going to competitions, it's super normal to go to competitions. We take the horses out of the trailer. They are fire breathing dragons. It's a new environment. There's other horses snorting and blowing, you know, it's like all this crazy stuff. So then we put them on a lunge line. We lunge them. They lunge like idiots. They finally get so tired. They calm down. Things are fine. This is how we do things. Um, now, every time the horses are, you know, if, if, if they even get to that level at this point, because it'll, again, when you're developing the body in this way, you're also toning the nervous system at the same time. So they can tolerate quite a lot more than they would have previously, because now they're developed to hold that it's, it's so cool. But, um, I've got one of my trainers, Samantha Watt, she's got some of the like national champion show horses in Australia, but she was laughing. She's like, I pull these horses out and if, if, and at this point they're developed enough that they don't go like crazy dragon, but if they start getting spooky, she's like, we just lead them around in pillar one for a little while. And everybody looks at us like, we're just mad because, you know, we're not lunging our horses. We're not doing like nothing. There's no lunging. There's no wild, crazy things. We're just taking them down and we're breathing with them and get them into this parasympathetic state and then they're fine. And then they, and they ride around like that. I mean, they're in pillar one while they're out there competing half of the time because they're developed to do so. And it's just so calm and so lovely. and they're winning everything and I'm like that's where we got to go <laughs> awesome um so so Rhonda says Tom Dorrance and Ray Hunt brought us a new way of relating to the horse and had had that kind of, that kind of, yeah I mean anybody who's coming in with anything that's not in the norm is ridiculed right but um Amber says Celeste has given so much validation to the undiagnosed lameness and the answer to health mm. the pads add to that for everyday horse owner and yeah I mean it's really cool we're basically right, Captain Planet <laughs> So, um, so this has been great. I have so enjoyed talking with you this evening and just getting to know you. And I, that was really what I wanted was just a, a lovely time Aww. Friday night to get to know you and, um, and hear your story because like I said, you know, it's the, um, the, the, the understanding of where somebody's coming from and, and how they're working has to do with their story. It has to mm -hmm. do with where they come from. And so often we tend to think to just want to look at just this little piece of it and not recognize the depth yeah and I think that that's the the thing that um is we can impart that information to people and help them along but you know the uh, how do I want to put this it's it is that breadth of knowledge from which this yeah. comes yeah. right that's really the bottom line and 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 all the the people I can think of that I know is it's true it's you know, it's not been an easy road or a straight road or a simple road, but it's been the path we've traveled to to get to the place where we know we can make a difference. Mm -hmm. That's very true. So um, looking forward to talking to you um, some more. I'm sure we'll, we'll have further conversations. And I'm uh, sure. <laughs> I'm so excited for you to come up here. It's going to be a blast. Yeah. And so you got to keep me informed on how things are going with the Surefoot pads. Okay. I will. I um, absolutely will. I'm really excited about that. Take some pictures and okay. uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Sounds good. Bye everybody. Bye. Just remember you can find this in all the other 300 plus webinars on the Surefoot <laughs> my YouTube channel and they are all recorded. Thanks so much everybody for tuning in and have a great night. Bye. Bye.